I guess I should start talking, right, Randy? <laughs> time you're ready. All right. Now time I'm ready. <laughs> hey, welcome to the Unified CXM Experience. Grooving out to uh, the right of the Valkyrie. It's GradCon. I am the Chief Experience Officer, CXO at Sprinkler. Uh, join If you're watching this on video, so we are now actually broadcasting these in video form as well. So if you are watching me on video over my um, right shoulder, just right behind me, you'll see a teddy bear sitting on my wire stand. That is the bear I have had since I was six months old. That bear has seen a lot of adventures and has been with me through thick and thin. And we will do an entire podcast on Teddy at some point. But just to, just to kind of preview that or preface that a little bit, Teddy uh, was has a repaired nose and um, paws, courtesy of my grandmother. It has uh, he has jammies, courtesy of my mom. And he is wearing a little collar, and that collar was the collar that my first cat, Punky, had. So there's a lot of emotion packed into that teddy bear over there. <laughs> and he's been uh, recently um, brought back from Seattle, where he was very well cared for by Susie, uh, who I'm very grateful to. Uh, and um, I bought Teddy a brand new to me suitcase to bring him uh, home like a gold brick. So uh, anyway, we'll have some fun with that later. But you'll notice him watching over the episode. And if he doesn't like something, he'll 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 tap me on the shoulder. So that could be a moment of weirdness if you're watching on video. <laughs> All right. So um, today we are talking about the first moment of truth. So we started this series. Um, basically, we're talking about how to build a marketing plan. And this applies to B2C or B2B. I'm going to probably put a B2B spin on it a bit today just because uh, that's the world that I'm, I'm inhabiting right now. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of throw some B2C components in there as well. But basically, the zero moment of truth is when people are researching online and looking to third parties uh, and other authorities to understand what they should buy. Uh, there's a great stat from Gardner, from the latest Gardner Marketing Symposium, that 60%, six zero, of your first time B2B website visitors have already decided to buy your product. Most of these B2B websites are written like you've never heard of them before, but in most cases, people are coming to buy. So think about Drift, Calendly, products like that, like make sure it's easy to get in touch with and talk to uh, your sellers. Uh, the second, first moment of truth we're gonna talk about today is you know, essentially standing in the grocery aisle. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. And the second moment of truth, uh, which comes uh, tomorrow, is going to be talking about how we experience the product for the first time. And in that product experience, um, how we think about wanting to buy, use, and enjoy that product again. So that'll be, that's, that'll be really interesting. The whole, the whole second moment of truth is critical because that's where people make long-term decisions about the product. So let's come to the first moment of truth. So let me give it a bit of an origin story. I'll talk a little bit about where it started from, and then I'll, I'll, I'll delve a little bit into um, SEO and SEM and some of the things you want to think about in terms of kind of quotation marks creating the aisle. Uh, so it started with Procter & Gamble, who did the first and second moment of truth. And the Procter & Gamble context was, I'm standing in, the, say, say the detergent aisle, I'm standing in the detergent aisle, and I am deciding which detergent to buy. And so um, there had been or has been sort of a longstanding bias amongst the agencies that Procter & Gamble works with that detergent is not that interesting. And so we, you know, I remember as a brand manager seeing ad presentations from agencies with you know polar bears and all sorts of different, you know, characters and all sorts of different sort of you know, gimmicks in them because they thought that the product was inherently not that interesting. So they're trying to create drama outside of the product. And that's a concept at P&G. Um, we, we used to run something called the Storyboard Seminar. I actually ran it a few times. It's a concept called irrelevant drama. So drama that doesn't have anything to do with the product itself, but it's meant to 
drive interest in the ad. And Bill Bernbach, who I think in some ways led a creative revolution that has created some dysfunctional behavior by agencies and creatives, uh, but he himself, I think, had the right intentions. Uh, he had this great comment. I love this. But he said, if you want to have someone stand on their head in the middle of an intersection, you're probably going to get some attention. But unless the product that you're advertising is a new change purse that keeps coins in your pockets even when you're upside down, the attention you're drawing is irrelevant. So find drama for sure, but do it in a way that's relevant to the product benefit, not just a way to get attention. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. We've all seen this. So in this sort of sea of irrelevant drama, part of what we would try to coach the agencies on is that while most people wouldn't talk about detergent in a bar, you know, present company excluded. I mean, detergent is very interesting. Um, the way it's made, how it works, the history of it, where it came from, super interesting. Uh, and I think, Randy, can we do a show on that? Can we do a whole show on surfactants? Would you mind? Sure. I'll add surfactants on that? to okay. the list. Surfactants to the list. I think when I'm in, like, like think of this would be a great end of the week. Um, so I'm super punchy, maybe exhausted. Um, maybe just closed a year end or something like that. Who knows? And uh, and I've just got to, like, just ramble for a few minutes. Surfactants, roll that, roll that bad boy out. Okay. Anyway, so... Most people, though, I would agree, don't talk about surfactants in a bar. Um, but for the 20 seconds or 30 seconds or 15 seconds, whatever that number is, that they're standing in the grocery aisle looking at the wall of detergents, it is the only thing they're thinking about. I'm going to say that again. For the moments that the person is deciding to buy your product, it's the only thing they're thinking about. This is the first moment of truth. And in, in that moment, they make a decision to grab your product. So there's a, there's a book called Marketing Warfare. It's by Al Reese and Jack Trout. And it was originally published in the 1980s. There have been, a, there's a, I think, 1985 maybe. There's a 20th anniversary edition out now, which looks pretty interesting. Um, that was published earlier in the 21st century. Uh, they also wrote the book Positioning. And if you've read the book Play Bigger, which is the sort of hype book of the moment in the B2B SaaS space, Play Bigger is essentially a rewrite of positioning. And the, the core concept of Play Bigger, positioning, and marketing warfare is that don't think about your competitors. Don't think about, you know, who you're opposite of. Think about the territory that you occupy within the mind of your customer. Because customers don't think so much in opposites, and they don't think so much in competitive terms. They think in terms of what does a brand stand for? And one of the examples that they use liberally in marketing warfare is 7up. And they actually worked on that account and did the original Uncola positioning. And what they knew is that Coke and Pepsi occupied dominant hills within the mind of the customer. And 7-Up at the time did not. It was just another soft drink. Now, it would be pretty tricky to topple Coca-Cola and its traditional values and cola and Pepsi and its sort of modern values, and it's a cola, from their positions. But you could create a new hill, and that new hill was the uncola hill. It's not a cola. That's why it's good. It's freshing. You know, it's, uh, it's sweet. You know, it's clear. Like, 7-Up positioned itself as something different. They have moved away oddly from that positioning over the last decades, but it was extraordinarily successful. Uh, in the 70s and 80s. And so they use that as an example of how to create a new hill that creates new preferences. 
because I would say it's occupying the hills in the customer's mind that's important, not trying to be, you know, anti this or anti that or, and you'll, you'll see these kinds of things spring up in companies where they'll get all excited about a competitor and they'll want to go after that competitor. Um, very dangerous because it distracts you from the mission of what you want to establish uniquely in the mind of your customer. Very hard to resist though. I mean, people get super excited about it. And unfortunately, while Marketing Warfare was a really sticky name and I, they sold a lot of books. It was very successful um, positioning for, for Al and Jack. I think it's gotten misinterpreted by people to think of marketing as, you know, actual war against a competitor. So the very thing that they were railing against is the very thing I think they've created more of. So the kind of interesting irony. By the way, um, no, that's, a, that's, an, that's an aside. I'm not going to go there. So uh, I'm just going to go talk about the song irony. Uh, so is it really irony? Uh, so so going going into this sort of topic of first moment of truth. So when you're standing in the aisle, something occupies a position in your mind. You're looking at the different products on the shelf and you choose one. That's the first moment of truth. Now, in the online world, in the B2B world, uh, your aisle is a little bit different. It's your, your website. Uh, it could be a social page, um, like Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, but, but you, you're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be some kind of presence in the metaverse, right? And so let's talk about the website. Let's kind of focus on that for now because that's, that's pretty common. So the, if you think about your website and you think about the first moment of truth, you know, what is the way that you think about positioning the website and what is the way that you get people to your website and how do you optimize around that first moment of truth to make sure that there's preference in people's minds? So this is going to take us into some interesting categories. We're going to talk about SEM. We're going to talk about SEO. We're going to talk about content marketing, and we're going to talk about contact tools on the website itself. So, you know, we talked a little bit already about the fact that people have already decided to buy your product when they come to your website. So could you please make it easy to get in touch with somebody? It's amazing how many B2B websites in particular go on and on about the product and you don't know how to talk to somebody. And in many cases, you've already decided to buy it. So, and there's a lot of work that can be done to sort of optimize against making sure that it's easy to get in touch, making sure that it's easy to talk to somebody. Uh, the second thing is, how do you get people to that site uh, with the right perspective? So we talked a lot about analysts, about review sites, and about influencers. That was in our zero moment of truth. Uh, another thing that's quite important is search. And because people are researching products in advance. And so when they're doing search, they're going to typically land on those three things I mentioned a moment ago, particularly the review sites, because they spend all their time and energy optimizing for search. So that's kind of their specialty, so that people land on their pages. But you want to make sure that you become a search magnet as well. And so SEO becomes really important. And one of the best ways to drive SEO is to make sure that you are building a really good content marketing strategy so that you're able to make sure that the content that people are looking for is on your site, shows up in search results, and then they can find it and understand more about not just your product, but ideally the category. The people who've done this best are people like Marketo with their definitive guides, uh, LinkedIn, they've done some incredible guides. Uh, essentially any client of Scorch, which is a, an amazing agency in St. Louis, um, they tend to have content that people go to because it defines how to work in the category, not just how to work with that product. So go, go deep and go heavy on that, no question. Now, the thing about SEO is it's a little bit like a greyhound race. So I, I'm not a supporter of racing dogs. You know, I have a beautiful dog who's very speedy, by the way, uh, but I would never ever think of racing uh, my dog. And, and typically the dogs that are raced are greyhounds. My, actually, my brother uh, had a couple of greyhounds uh, for many years when he was a professor in Amherst. And uh, they're beautiful dogs. Uh, he had rescues that had been on the track. And the way that greyhounds are, I mean, trust me, I'm going to get to my point here, so just stay with me for a second here. The way the greyhounds are raced is they put them on a track, and then they have a mechanical device, which is a, a sort of a, a little pole. And at the end of the pole is a, a fake rabbit. I'm sure at some point it was a real rabbit, but thank God it's now a fake rabbit. And then that fake rabbit is uh, activated, and the 
uh, Paul moves around the oval track and the greyhounds chase the rabbit. And that's how they get them to race. And of course, the greyhounds never catch the rabbit. No matter how fast they go, the rabbit can always go faster. So SEO is a little bit like being the greyhound. You're the greyhound, by the way. Yeah, you're the dog in this scenario. And the rabbit is, you know, SEO. You'll never, ever catch it. Like, you are always working on it. So never think of SEO as something that you're ever going to be complete on, uh, but something you have to always work on and keep optimizing. What is also important is to make sure that you don't chase SEO. Uh, it's important that you build the right content and build the right product story and build the right you know, image for your brand that you think is correct and as opposed to chasing keywords. Uh, it's very dangerous to do that because they'll change, algorithms change, and competitors change. And if you've built a site optimized for a particular point in time on SEO, it'll be irrelevant in the future. If you optimize your site for your products and your positioning and story, you know, it'll, it'll be evergreen. So you'll always be fine. So that becomes important. Now, the sort of sister to SEO is SEM, search engine marketing. And search engine marketing, I, I feel like people don't take it as seriously as they should. The beauty of search engine marketing, particularly in B2B, is it's very intent-based. I'm, I'm searching for something because I intend to buy it because I'm interested in it. So that level of intent and that high level of intent is, is very compelling. And so anything that's intent-based um, is something that you always want to flex towards because that's someone who is looking for what you have to do. Now, the cool thing about SEM as well is that if you think in media building block terms, you know, SEM is the highest converting tactic typically and there's a limit to it. There are only so many searches that people are doing against a certain set of terms. So you actually can maximize your SEM spend and then go on to the next tactic. Now, I don't know if you've, we've talked about media building blocks before, but it was a concept that originally originated, uh, I don't know if that's right grammar there, but it originated, that's better, it originated in the 1980s, and the idea was do as much as you can of your most efficient media tool and then move to the next thing, depending on the size of your budget. So typically, TV would always be the most efficient because it's both very good reach and frequency vehicle. And then you'd get to print. Depends on the kind of campaign and the category, but you know, print in terms of magazines or newspapers or billboards. And then you'd see radio. Sometimes radio would be before print. Uh, and then you'd see outdoor. Typically, it would be coming last. And then you'd see you know, really weird stuff like you know shopping carts and stuff like that. And so the, that media building block concept is something that's been a little bit lost, but I do think we should bring it back. And I would always start with SEM, maximize the spend on that, and then start moving on to things like programmatic display. Um, right now, I would say that people have a tendency to do programmatic display more earlier than they should, and they've not yet fully spent the SEM budget. Part of that is because the visibility of programmatic is higher, and it's always more satisfying to the management of the company to see their ads and say, aha, those are the ads I'm looking for, uh, versus the more invisible nature of SEM and all the stuff we talked about in the Zero Moment of Truth. This political balancing of doing stuff that delivers results but it's not as easy to see and doing stuff that people can see, it's a tricky part of marketing. It's like the political part of marketing. If you've got a really good CEO, if you've got a really good team that really understands what you're doing, um, you can usually stay with the stuff that delivers the results. But, you know, if you've got a team that's like, I want to see the thing or I want to see the rank, then, you know, you're going to have to make sure you sort of flex to that as well. And um, uh, so think about the sophistication of the team you're working with and, you know, deliver deliver what's both emotionally satisfying for them and satisfying for the business. This is a, a key learning that I have had over the years. So um, so that's kind of the first moment of truth. I'm standing in the aisle, and your aisle could be a website, your aisle could be an actual aisle, uh, or your aisle could be uh, on Amazon. And there are many ways of thinking about how to influence people in that first moment of truth. But the key thing is, you know, I would go back and read Marketing Warfare and Positioning. And think about what is the battle you're really going after. And the battle is in your customer's mind. And your competitors are not battling against you. They're battling for a piece of property in your customer's mind. And if you don't own a hill inside the customer's mind, when they come to your aisle, um, they won't know how to think about you. 
and they won't prefer you. So uh, you've got to own that property. So I think that was kind of a, I think that was a pretty fun, I enjoyed that episode actually. It was kind of a fun way of sort of thinking about um, uh, aisles and websites as being sort of common. And hopefully there's some good ideas and lessons in there in terms of how to think about both drive traffic and drive leads uh, to your website. So for the Unified CXM Experience, I'm Grad Khan, your host and Chief Experience Officer at Sprinkler. And that's it for today. I'll see you next time. Thank you.